So I grew up in a pastor's house, and one of the annoying things about being a pastor's kid is that you're usually one of the last people to go home from church. You're especially captive in that moment when you don't have a driver's license yet and you can't leave until your dad is done talking, which takes a while. So one time after we did finally, I finally had my full license so I could drive on my own and we usually took two cars to church because the pastor got there quite a bit earlier than the rest of his family wanted to. I didn't want to stick around and listen to my parents' chat forever. And so I asked my dad for the keys so I could drive myself and my younger brother home. And this leads to a sort of short and familiar physical journey, the journey from our church back to our house, that kind of mirrors the journey that our disciples took in a boat in our gospel reading today, one that starts out with the human characters in confident control. They've done this before. They were fishermen. They've been on the Sea of Galilee They are confident that they can do what Jesus asks and get from one side to the other. Well, I was likewise confident, having made the trip a number of times, that I could drive home my brother and I from church without much issue. But like the disciples, something happens that I have no control over and didn't expect that leads to a shocking moment of prayer, and then a realization that I'm not in control, but that God is in control, and I end up in the exact same place the disciples do, a place of trembling dependency. That's the disciples' journey in Mark 4 today, and if we're being honest, and if you think about it as I reflect on my own story, you probably have one of these yourselves. You probably have many, because this reflects a journey that we often make over and over and over again. But it doesn't just display our lack of control and God's control. Like the story in Mark 4 today, it also displays what God, who is in control of all things, does for us. So let's jump into the text. We're beginning in our place of confident control. Jesus has been teaching large crowds, and He wants to get away from them for a little while. And so He instructs His disciples to go across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. And here is how they respond. It says, and leaving the crowd, they, the disciples, took him, Jesus, with them in the boat. So even the way that the language of that sentence lets us know that who's in charge, or at least who thinks they're in charge, is the disciples. They're taking Jesus with them in the boat. And you can almost picture it, right? They're fishermen. They know what they're doing Jesus, are you ready? Did you pack all the right stuff? We've got this, right? Did you bring your sunscreen? Did you pack your bathing suit? Do you have a life vest? We're the experts here. We're confident and we're in control of the situation. They're in familiar territory, as it were. They've been on the boats on the Sea of Galilee many times. This is their wheelhouse. So they quickly take charge. They're taking Jesus with them. Never mind that it was Jesus' suggestion in the first place. It very quickly became the disciples' journey. Well, when framed this way, I'm sure this sounds familiar to you. We do this all the time. Jesus puts something in our minds through His Holy Word, and rather quickly we tend to take charge of the situation ourselves. And it's especially true when it's something that we feel confident about confident in our own abilities, either because we're familiar with it or we've done it many times, or this is the very thing I went to school to be trained and learned how to do. Come on, Jesus, I'll take you with me. So hopping back to my parallel story, I've got my full driver's license. We get in my dad's Suzuki Esteem, turn the key into the ignition and set off down the road. It's maybe 10 miles to our house from the church. Get on the highway, go down a couple of exits, get off the highway. No biggie. But we're driving along, and then it's in one of those hot days of spring, summertime, and when there hasn't been rain for a little while, and then all of a sudden, for about 10 seconds, just a crazy, intense downpour of rain. 
enough to get all the oils from the road up to the surface, but not enough to wash them out off of the road. And so I'm driving along, as a teenage boy would, and I shifted over into the left lane because I'm going to pass the slowpoke in front of me. And I look up and I see a bunch of red taillights. And not only that, but people weaving in and out of lanes to avoid rear-ending each other. And I'm still maybe about 200 yards away from the semi-truck that is in front of me in this lane, and so I slam on the brakes. This is, car did not have anti-lock brakes, so the brakes lock up and we begin to slide. And this was on the highway where the speed limit was 70 miles an hour, and I maybe was going a little bit more than that. pause, we'll come back to that. So what happens in the next few verses of our gospel reading shows the very same thing happening to the disciples. They've set out in confidence in their ability to navigate the sea, and yet they run into a situation that destroys the illusion of control they have, a reality that they can't deal with. Pretty quickly after the boat sets out, the text says that a windstorm arises and waves are crashing into the boat so much so that the boat itself is starting to fill with water. Now, if you've ever been on a boat in the midst of something like this, it truly is frightening. It truly is. Or if you've been on a horse or any sort of where you're on a vehicle that isn't going to do what you say it should just because you say so. And then that moment of the loss of control comes and you become very afraid. Well, despite the disciples' familiarity, expertise, and experience as fishermen, the storm is too much for them. They don't know what to do. They think they're going to die. And all the while, and they're probably bitter at Jesus at this point, because all the while Jesus is sleeping on the cushion in the front of the boat. Well, Jesus is God. He's not worried about anything. But the disciples don't quite know that yet, and you can tell by the way they address Jesus, right? So their confidence gives place to shock, a bit of despair, and then they cry out, and this is the one thing they do correctly, they cry out to Jesus this prayer. It's not the holiest of prayers. And here's what they say, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing after they wake Jesus up? So despite the fact that their prayer isn't very holy, and it's a prayer that they have turned to Jesus out of desperation because they literally have no other options anymore, all of their best efforts have failed, they've looked around, they can't find out what to do, and so they turn to the sleeping God of the universe in the front of the boat. Now they address Him as teacher, so they're still not fully getting who Jesus is. But the second thing that this teaches us, because Jesus answers their pathetic prayer, is that even when we turn to God as a last resort, He'll have us. This was an aspect of the nature of God that really came to a head for me when I was reading the book by C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain, and he has this great quote that describes the nature of our God. He says this, he says, I call this a divine humility because it is a poor thing to strike our colors to God when the ship is going down under us, a poor thing to come to Him as a last resort, to offer up, quote, our own when it is no longer worth keeping. If God were proud, He would hardly have us on such terms, but He is not proud. He stoops to conquer. He will have us even though we have shown that we prefer everything else to Him and come to Him because there is nothing better now at hand. Perfectly describes the scenario in our gospel reading today. The ship is literally going down. The disciples have tried everything they could think of and as a last resort, well, I suppose, will cry out to Jesus. And what is Jesus' response? He doesn't rebuke the disciples right away. The first thing He does is He answers their prayer. He stands up and speaks peace 
be still. And his first words aren't directed at the disciples to calm their worried hearts. Instead, he is speaking to the wind and the sea. And they listen. They cease. They stop. Then he does offer a small rebuke to his disciples, but only after he has dealt with a thing that threatens them. And if we can think throughout our lives, he's done very similar things for us. Now we'll hop back to my parallel journey. I've just switched into the left lane to pass the slow poke in front of me. I see all the red brake lights and people weaving in and out of roads. I found out afterwards that what had happened is a truck had flipped over and slid off the road in front of a, a pretty decent amount of traffic, and so everybody started slamming on their brakes and swerving. Well, I was no different. Slammed on my brakes, brakes locked up. We're sliding probably 200 yards. I think my estimate is we were probably going 70, 75. The brakes were probably going to get us down to 50 before we hit the back of the semi truck. The next part of the story I have zero recollection of. I don't remember how I maneuvered between lanes and avoided hitting vehicles. Somehow I did. And the next thing I know, I'm bumping an old boat Cadillac. I'm going 15 miles an hour, he's going 10. I just give him a little nudge on his way and he keeps going. And I am just sitting there amazed and frightened and trying to figure out what is happening. All my confident control, gone. The problem was dealt with, certainly not by me. I don't have those kind of driving skills, especially by the fact that I can't remember any of the details. But somehow God protected us. So the problem's dealt with by God, and now He turns to His disciples. He turns to me. He turns to you. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Then the disciples, seeing what Jesus has done, are given their first real glimpse of who is in the boat with them. He's not just some amazing teacher, after all. And they're filled with a new kind of fear, the fear that they're sharing a boat with somebody who can tell the wind and the waves to be quiet, and they listen. It turns out, then, they ask this question. It says, they were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? Turns out, Jesus is not an ordinary man. He's not even an extraordinary man. But nothing less than God in the flesh is in them, in the boat with them. Now, this fear that they feel stems both from their lack of control in the situation and the total control that resides with someone other than them, in this case, God. Or to put it another way, the disciples in the boat realize they're completely at the mercy, not of the wind and of the waves, but of Jesus. But Jesus demonstrates that at His mercy, while a fearful place to be, is also wonderful. That even though the disciples put their faith in themselves, Jesus mercifully delivers them when their misplaced faith fails. How true is that for us as well? How often we put our faith in anything but God, and we don't even realize it sometimes until everything comes crashing down. Faith in our own ability that comes up short, or we royally mess something up. Faith in money, in reputation, in family, whatever it may be, it ends eventually at some point the same way this boat in the storm. no control, totally at the mercy of God. Now, in my parallel story, my brother and I, we pulled off the highway at the exit to get home and kind of pulled the car over. We're both breathing hard like we've run a marathon. 
There's an upended cooler full of water in the back seat pouring out everywhere that we don't even notice yet. And running through my mind are a couple of thoughts. First is, thank you, God, because I have no idea how that didn't end up some other way, a much worse way. And the second thought is, my dad is going to kill me (laughs) because it was his car, and I was sure there was some giant dent in the front. So here I am in the same place, the disciples, trembling dependency, realizing that more often than I'd like to admit, really all the time, even in my most familiar journeys, I'm at the mercy of God. Now, you've likely been brought to such a place yourself, starting out on a journey on your own steam, trusting in your own ability, confident in what you're going to be able to do, maybe even thinking like the disciples, come on, Jesus, I'll show you the way, only to face the harsh truth that you're not in control, and it frightens you, especially when it takes away your sense of control in your most familiar places, in the places that you want to feel the most confident in your own abilities. But this truth is not the only thing our text teaches us today, as humbling as it is and as true as it is. There's something else that is taught to us as well, that in those moments when we are essentially forced by our own inability to call out to God, we're told, one, He can certainly handle the thing you can't. The thing that is threatening to take your life, Jesus stands up and just speaks to, and it's done. Your own sin. Jesus speaks to it today. Your sin is forgiven. And it is. It must be because of the person saying it. You are mine. You must be because of the person saying it. Which leads to the second amazing thing taught in our text for today. It's not that God is an all-powerful being who can command even the wind and the sea, which is certainly true, but that He uses all of that might and power to save the creatures who are totally at His mercy, because He is a God of mercy. All that power, all that control is being turned toward one goal in Jesus the salvation of all who call upon His name, the salvation of His disciples in the boat, of me and my brother in that car, and you on whatever journey it is where your sense of control has been taken away and in turn given to God. It is a fearful thing to be completely dependent on another person, much less on God and having to deal with one's own lack of control. As Christians, though, we can be thankful that the one we depend on is merciful and loves overconfident sinners such as ourselves and says to all the things in life that threaten us both temporally and, most importantly, eternally, peace be still, and they must listen for He is God, and He is in control of all things. In the name of Jesus, amen.